Hey guys, the Reverend Ty here with part two of our anvil series, and we're going to be talking about methods of manufacture when it comes to anvils. Now, this may seem like something you absolutely don't need to know, but believe me, it is something you need to know because understanding how an anvil was made is pretty much going to tell you how high quality that anvil is, can it be prepared, and what you're going to need to pay for it. So, we're going to try to make this as brief as possible, give you all the high notes. Now, First of all, let me say that we're starting out uh, with anvils in the relatively recent 200 year period, okay? Because understanding the scope of blacksmithing, there are as many different types of anvils as there are morally questionable women at Panama City Beach. So let's start off with exactly about anvil sizes since they do come in a lot of different sizes. I've got some helpful uh, drawing board hints up here, so check it out. Uh, anvils are gonna come in three basic flavors, uh, small, medium, and Ron Jeremy. So your small anvils are going to be uh, under five pounds. And the vast majority of these anvils that you're going to find that are under five pounds are not actually using anvils. Uh, there used to be a thing as anvil salesmen. And so just like today, when the salesman comes around, he gives you a pen with the company logo. Well, there were many of these little anvils that were done just like that. They were paperweights given as basically company pens or company pads. There are a few jeweler's anvils that are very, very timely. They're made for doing very delicate work, but those are, are pretty rare. I mean, even, even though I've been in the trade a very long time, not very many I've ever seen, uh, just not very common. Now, what is very common is going to be your middle-sized anvil, which is going to be around 100 pounds. Now, again, there are several different manufacturers. In fact, there was a, a plethora of anvil manufacturers at the time. Uh, uh, but 100 pound is basically what I would refer to as a farm anvil. It, just like we have some tools in our drawer at the house for working on the car, every farm had a small blacksmith setup. Now it did not preclude the need for a blacksmith who would usually have larger anvils and larger forges, but small work could be done on the farm was done on these 100 pound anvils. And those anvils actually comprise the majority of anvils that we have floating around, especially here in the south. Uh, now there's a step up from that that's pretty much going to be into the blacksmithing end, but I'm going to categorize that as the Ron Jeremy anvils. So these are anvils from 250 to 1,000 pounds. Now things are a little different between the southern United States and the northern United States. Down here, a 250 pound anvil is very unusual. Uh, the only time that you had an anvil of that size was at a, usually a large blacksmith shop. Uh, we had very few major towns down here, so every now and then you come across a 500 pounder and there's rumor had there's even a thousand pounder somewhere in Smithfield, Georgia. I've yet to find it. But these anvils are very rare here in the south. However, as I understand it, uh, they are much more common in the industrialized north, uh, but they are, again, monstrous. And there's also several specialized anvils like a bridge anvil or railroad anvils uh, that easily weigh six and seven hundred pounds. So for you just starting out as a beginner, what you need to be focused on is this guy right here. Now, there are three basic types of construction when it comes to an anvil in the past 200 years and pretty much one type of pattern. So let's talk about the pattern real quick. So, during the colonization of the U.S., uh, England had pretty much a death grip on the anvil market. So there was a particular shape of anvil that was used and pretty much sold to the U.S., which became known as the London pattern, which is the familiar shape that most of us know. Understand there's lots of other different types of European patterns, but because England had that death grip on the market, almost all the anvils here in the U.S., the vast majority, are going to be the modern or the London pattern anvil. Okay, the London pattern anvil pretty much came in three flavors since 1840. That is going to be a wrought iron base with a steel plate on top, a cast iron base with a steel plate on top, and a cast steel plate, uh, excuse me, a cast steel anvil with a hardened face. So originally the first anvils that came out after 1840 is when they started welding that steel plate at the top are going to be raw iron. And the way they actually put these guys together is pretty freaking fantastic because most people assume that a shape that's this complex has to be poured. Wrought iron was never liquid, so it could not be poured. These anvils were actually made from basically five big chunks of metal. There would be one piece for the body, 
there would be one piece for this foot, one piece for this foot, a horn, and a heel. And these pieces will be individually heated in different furnaces, brought to a large central anvil, and then literally hammer welded together by a team of men. So the method of manufacture was quite, quite intense. The reason that they began to add a steel plate to the top was because wrought iron is very soft. And if you did as much work on top of your anvil as they used to, uh, the anvil would saddle back. It would actually sway out right here and the entire piece would have to be put back into the fire and hammer back into shape, which in a production shop got to be tedious and tiresome. The addition of a steel plate that was much tougher would not saddle back out much, uh, nearly as badly uh, as the pure wrought iron. So, Let's jump forward to the late 1800s and the invention of the Bessemer process, which is something you do need to lick up. Uh, you do need to lick up the Bessemer process. Uh, Bessemer process was a revolution in the iron industry. It allowed uh, mass quantities of cast iron to be poured into molds. And with that advent came the cast iron with the steel plate. Now, uh, these were the cheap anvils of the time. They were much faster to produce, but they were not as durable because once they cracked, they pretty much could not be repaired even by that fancy new electric welding that came out in the late 1800s. So when you hear a lot of professional blacksmiths or people turn their nose up at an anvil or call it a, the endearing term a boat anchor, normally they are referring to this cast iron anvil with a steel plate. The anvils can be repaired, oftentimes not to satisfaction. And, uh, you know, again, I referred to the sliding glass door argument, uh, not can you do it, but should you do it. So this is where most of the issue is going to occur with that cast iron anvil. Uh, for the beginner, if it's a heavy enough place and there's a place for you to hammer on, good on you. But if you're going to spend $600 on an anvil, do not get a beat up cast iron anvil and I think that's going to be a prevailing wisdom by a lot of professional smiths. Uh, I will buy a cast iron anvil, but it is a wall hanger. It is a decorator item. It is not something I use. Okay? Now, coming in uh, in the most recent time is going to be your cast steel anvil with a hardened face. So this is the pinnacle of anvil technology. Instead of having to have uh, this poorly cast iron base for the shape and then a steel plate. Now, because of our technology, we are able to pour entire blocks of steel that are, are consistent, uh, free of inclusion. They are awesome. So let me say unequivocally, the things that we have now far exceed what we used to have. Uh, cast steel anvils, I believe, start showing up around 1900. Uh, coals, I have a cast steel coal swell, the anvil that I rebuilt here recently is a cast steel anvil. The entirety of that piece is one solid perfection chunk of good hard steel. So if you can find a modern uh, anvil, I think there were some hay buttons that were completely cast. I believe there are a few Trentons that were completely cast. Uh, this was the preferred method to make an anvil and is the toughest one out there. So that's how they were made. So again, you can see uh, from a practical point of view, you want the anvil that's the toughest, not this sentimental or it's that old, because this is the other thing that I want to make sure and stress to everybody, because a lot of people that are getting started into this, um, there is this notion that, man, they just don't make them like they used to, um, you know, the older the better. Remember this, used ain't new. Now, if you're a hobbyist and you can get by on something, fantastic that is a good to go deal but in a situation like mine where I'm a professional using a tool not an antiquity but a tool uh, what works is what works uh, not for any sentimental value uh, if it holds up and our technology and being able to cast steel far exceeds being able to put anvils together with wrought iron chunks in fact uh, there was this kind of one of these other wives' tales that back during the Civil War when Sherman marched through Georgia, look, your, look up your history, uh, one of the things that he ordered his soldiers to do was to take a sledgehammer and knock the horns off of the anvil so that the Confederates could not shoot the cavalry. I'm going to claim that is absolute bunk. One, because if somebody came into my shop and knocked the horn off my anvil, and I couldn't bend something, I suck as a blacksmith. All right, that's the first thing.
The other thing is, is that anvils that were wrought iron pretty much routinely broke because of the hammer wells that were here and here. Uh, if the weld was not completely sound, if it was not solid, or it just got too much hammering, which a lot of these anvils endured, it would simply break. But now, every time somebody finds an anvil with a broken piece, oh, Sharon did it. So, uh, not good stuff. So guys, there's your education on how anvils were manufactured. As always, if you like the videos, please comment, like, subscribe, share this crap. You know, this is how it works. Outside that, guys, I want to tell you how much I appreciate all the mail you guys are sending. I've been enjoying doing these videos, and I hope very much that you do as well. You guys take care, and I will see you tomorrow.